Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Werner Vogels, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Amazon, and we are talking about his predictions for 2024. Werner, good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. And I, uh, I'm very excited to talk about it. Yeah, well, before we start, let me ask about the genesis of these predictions. I know they're much awaited. How long have you been doing them for? Well, I, I think probably six, seven, eight years now. Uh, but what happened is, of course, that um, especially with AWS and so many businesses running on top of AWS, you kind of start seeing larger patterns happening. And, and you know, if you look at the more innovative, newer businesses, you see where their interests are. So I have a unique um, opportunity to sort of aggregate that knowledge of, of our customers and then sort of start to think about what kind of advice would I give to CIOs or CTOs uh, that are thinking about sort of what should I be focusing on? So let's talk about the predictions um, for next year. What do you see on the horizon? Well, I think the first and foremost one, well, it's hard these days, of course, to not talk about AI. Yeah, there's always some level of impact that we'll see in technology come coming up. But, uh, you know, uh, I always try to pick a few predictions that are, let us say, not obvious. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussion about generative AI and where it is going. But I think one of the, I was at the um, AI for Good conference by the UN earlier in Geneva. Mm -hmm. And there I really start to understand what sort of the issues are that that the larger community has. And one of these is, of course, that, you know, the the current large language models are mostly trained on English data uh, or, or Western data and yeah. mostly in, in, in English. Yeah, and even though we can do really well do translation into other languages, but the corpus underneath there still is very Western. Um, and the example I always like to give that, you know, if you ask in a, an English uh, uh, core large language model to summarize a book by Isabella Allende, mm -hmm. you probably get a very different answer from um, a book that would, uh, from a, a large language model that would be trained on South American content. Mm. Yeah. And I such a thing that is really crucial and important. And there's this indeed a good example by these guys from uh, from the researchers from Georgia Tech that indeed demonstrated that even if a model is trained on uh, on Arabic texts or then you know you can get a culturally accurate response mm -hmm. if you give advice um, not something that you would get if you would actually do this on a Western model so it's very important, I think, for a worldwide audience to be able to get access to large language models that also incorporate their culture. Well, one thing that, let's unpack that a little bit. First of all, um, if it's only being trained on English language models, does that mean that countries in which English is the dominant language currently have an advantage in AI, or is that going too far? Uh, no, I think, I think the, the, of course, you know, the quality of all these large language models is about the data. Right. And it goes actually for all AI, not only for large language models. Uh, the better the quality of the data is, you that will be reflected in eventually in the model. And the largest data set that was available is Common Crawl. Mm -hmm. And that is dominantly English and Western texts. And I said, yes, that's where they trained on. But that's also why you now see many other countries, whether that is in the United Emirates or in India or in China and Japan and South Korea, um, where you get these new large language models that are all trained on, on local texts and in their native language. Mm. So yeah, I, I see that there is a, a culture shift happening there. And of course, we, we are looking in research continuously whether these large language models can learn from each other. Yeah, and it's one of the, if, whether it's for uh, reinforcement learning or through multi-agent debate, uh, that these models basically talk to each other and sort of try to figure out what is the right answer. And as such, then create feed feedback loops again to update the models them, themselves. That seems scary, disintermediating the humans um, completely. You know, the models um, talk to each other, but... <laughs> I I get it. I'm not I'm not a fear monger. I'm actually very excited about AI. So um so this prediction then is very much that 
we will, in essence, democratize the these large language learning models by essentially bringing in other languages? Also, yeah, and, and absolutely. And of course, you know, the approach that we've taken at, at Amazon is to try and democratize access to these large language models. Now, the dominant ones at these moments are, uh, are, are already available through Amazon Bedrock, but I expect that there will be many more in the future. And hopefully, one uh, with different cultural backgrounds. So if I'm a CIO or CTO watching this, what's the actionable aspect of that? Is it to really be aware of the fact that the landscape is changing? Or is it to be aware of the fact that the landscape is currently very limited, so be careful about what you're using? Uh, absolutely. I think it's also what I would like them to take aware, uh, away with from this is that research is happening to try and solve this problem. But you should realize um, what the current, what the limitations of the current models are. Mm. Yeah, understand. And definitely, if you run maybe a worldwide operation or something that is, is incorporates environments with many different cultures, but you should be aware that the answers that you're getting from the current models may be restricted in terms of culture. Right. And Good point. Such, you know. Uh, and after all, and that goes for all AI, there's still assistance. Yeah? We as humans make decisions. We need to interpret the answers that are getting, come, coming back and decide what we do with that. Yeah. We don't let these machines you know, decide for us. So that's prediction number one. Any other, mm -hmm. what are some of your other predictions? Well, one of them, and, and I'm very happy that it's actually ha happening. I really see sort of women healthcare technology to support women healthcare really taking off. Mm. You're seeing significant investments in, in women-led uh, startups, and, and quite a few of those are, are tackling issues that are specific for women health. Now, if you um, and, and, and while doing research on this topic, where I was looking at sort of what. What, what's the history here of women health care? Yeah, is, is there indeed a big differentiation between general health care and, and that? And I found out that actually there were no real women clinical trials for women until I think 1993. Before that, they were not allowed to take part. Right, because yeah. of the risk to and, their and fertility for, and such. That That's in, in general, but also as such, the rest was excluded from it. Mm. And I think there's a number of, of, of issues that have been sort of not, not tackled because there was stigma or taboo around it. Yeah, take an issue like, um, like menopause, yeah, which almost every woman will go through, yet it's hard to discuss it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as such, you know, technology solutions as well as medical solutions are still at the forefront. Yeah, they still need to happen. Yeah, all the hormone replacement therapies at the moment are quite broad still. And I believe this is an area definitely where we will see much more precision medicine happening over time, uniquely targeting uh, the issues that, that some of the women have. No, and, that's and, a good point. You know, this is, it's not just an issue of, of um, you know, many women that go through menopause think that they have dementia. Yeah, or, or many other cases. And so also because there's no conversation around this, not much has been done on it. But we see a clear shift happening there. Uh, and whether that is in building devices or, or wearables or, you know, a lot of data driven uh, uh, targeted healthcare, uh, I, I believe, you know, really off the brink of really shifting there. You know, I'm curious with that particular prediction, Werner, it, do you think it's mainly because of the advances in technology and obviously, you know, a lot going on um, just in terms of, you know, bio biologics, is that how you call it? And, and, you know, genome research and such. But how much is it also due to just a cultural shift? You know, we're talking more about mental health. Um, it feels like there's just more of an opening to be talking about what were previously sensitive topics, like you mentioned menopause. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a cultural shift happening, which, of course, you know, allows uh, these investments to happening in these companies as well. They are, these issues are, I think, extremely important, um, but we're able to talk about it more broadly now. 
and I think definitely you know, things in around menopause, for example, have seen significant publications over the past two years, getting it more into sort of the general uh, conf conversation. You know, but you know, the, there was um, an interesting TV series, I think, in on the BBC that actually started with that this woman is going to her physician and she says, it is actually a male that has to tell me that I'm in a menopause. Yeah, why aren't there more conversations among women ourselves? Yeah, mm. why don't we learn more about that? And I think that has become a significant driver in, in the rise of female te female health technology. Yeah. So is um, in some ways that almost sounds like an investment. This is, certainly sounds like something that is good to be aware of with regard to consumer behavior. You've got access to a mountain of data around these areas. Are you seeing anything in purchase patterns or anything else that would be indicative of this shift towards more of a focus on well, women's I think, health? Uh, I don't think I have, have any insight in purchase patterns and things like that. That's not necessarily something that, that we, we, we track. But I do track the number of startups, for example, in this space and what are okay. they focused on? Yeah, and, and how much uh, the fact that we now all have this, this mobile device in our hand, what are the kind of things that we can do with that to, in, in general, in healthcare, yeah. uh, kind of make, make progress? And, and of course, you know, AI is going to play a role in this as assistance to, to, to doc doctors. Uh, I just read that report on, in, in Sweden, there is a, um, uh, this national healthcare that motivates women to, I think, to have a mammogram each two or three years. And of course, these doctors that need to look at it need to look at hundreds of thousands of these images. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that, that an assistant, an AI system that had been built for them, actually detects 30% more cancer potentials. I believe that. And their AI is good as two radiologists actually reviewing those, those images. Yeah. So technology will play an extremely important role there. Yeah, I think precision medicine is very exciting. Okay, so prediction number three. I don't know how many you have this year, but uh, what four, else do you have? Four. four, okay. <laughs> now four is a lot. Well, now I need to actually look at my papers as well. <laughs> now the third one is again, going back to AI. I think about two years ago, two to three years ago, I wrote about um, the rise of the use of AI tech technology to support developers. Mm -hmm. And mostly at that moment, we were still thinking about having, helping them write code. Yeah? Because the common pattern among engineers is, uh, oh, now ask a question on Stack Overflow, or I'll look at the documentation here and then do copy and paste. And, and so as a, as such a pattern was there that we could already start building for. And, and tools like Code Whisperer and, and uh, Copilot and others become mm -hmm. quite successful targeting that. But what we see is that there's a room for the whole software trajectory. Now, if I'm, one of the things I was thinking about this, this morning is that how many of the original engineers that built Amazon S3 are still on that team? How much institutional knowledge is, is there? And I think the room with new layer large language model support for a broader set of software tech, tech technologies allows us for, to have a conversation, to explore, mm -hmm. to have, for example, new um, engineers that come onto the team to understand the complete code base, decisions that have been made, challenges, challenges that there are, and to help them make plans how to attack a particular problem. So it goes much more, much beyond just the heavy lifting. It goes to the much bigger software picture. And if I look at sort of where sometimes our engineers have to spend significant amount of time on is, is when sort of software infrastructure changes for them. Um, mm -hmm. I give the example in the prediction of going from Java 7 to a next generation of, of Java. And then it turns out that's not just recompiling something that makes significant changes to software. It's just busy work. Yeah. That is doesn't contribute to the, to the product that you're building. And as such, I feel that we have that we're quite well on our way to start to deliver technologies that can help throughout the whole software uh, life cycle. So let me unpack that a little bit because I know that obviously a lot of CIOs are very interested in your prediction. So let's say I'm in that position. 
Obviously, I know AI is transformative across the entire corporation with regard to getting rid of that busy work, as you call it. When you talk specifically about, in essence, the IT function, um, do you see more transformation there over the next year than you would in some of the other functions, you know, across the uh, company? Well, I, I think it, it's, I definitely think that we had uh, a start in this area. Why? Because we started thinking, of course, when we had these larger models to start to think about how would it help ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, also as a very good test case. So I do think that sort of the support for software development is ahead of, of quite a few other areas. And, um, uh, and I believe that that will only grow. You okay. will start to realize, I, I, for example, if you hire someone that just comes out of college, it's, he's, he or she is not an, um, a, a full blown developer yet. He has to learn a lot. You have to learn the, the practices of the team. You have to learn about how the code was written. Maybe you even have to learn a different programming language. So this can uh, accelerate it in essence, which is, and, which is great. Yeah, if there was a senior engineer looking over your shoulder the whole time and help you. That sounds yeah, both daunting become... and helpful. A senior engineer yeah, looking it's... over your shoulder. Um, that's, well, that's, I think that's interesting. So let me get to number four before, because yeah. uh, I would uh, not, I would like to get the full picture of what Werner Vogel is seeing for 2024. Well, one of the things that I've, I've seen, it's an observation that I've had over the past years where more and more, uh, when I see uh, engineers coming out of coming out of university, coming out of school, to still need to learn a lot when they end up in the job, they're not a yep. developer yet. Yeah, they have the basic skills, but they're not like teamwork. And there's so many things that they have to learn that there is always significant on the job training. And and one of the challenges I think that we've also seen in in IT in the, the recent years is that we still have a lot of open positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recently was in, in, in Germany and there they told me that 80,000 open IT positions, not all of them require a four year degree. You know, and, and as such, although I, I'm not saying that the four year degree doesn't have any value. No, I actually think it has no, but the, value. Yeah, the, the almost apprenticeship model, the skills based learning, that sort of thing. Yeah, ab absolutely. And as such, I think there is a more education going to happen outside of outside of the universities. Now, if I look, for example, there's a, a school in Berlin that I visited called the Ready School. Yeah. And they are taking, um, they are teaching refugees. Uh, Germany has taken in 1 million refugees. Quite a few from are already educated, but not in tech technology. So they give a one year schooling to actually introduce them into technology. And almost everyone has a job even before they leave uh, the, 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 the school. Yeah. So I do believe there is a, there's a significant shift there. And also it sees, for example, Amazon has been significantly investing in training people around the world in AI and tech, uh, literally tens of millions there. Yeah. And that's the target. No, I so, think yeah, that's, I, I think in, that's very true. Uh, so, so really this shift away from the universities towards almost more of a marketplace learning, um, you know, frankly, it is a entry level to the job sort of training so yeah and, and and of course large companies large technology companies have been able to be investing in that for their engineers but i do see the pattern coming back almost for every company uh, okay if i if i would you would want to ask me what's actionable here the thing is that cios and ctos need to start thinking about how do I ensure that my my engineers are learning for the rest of their life how do we institutionalize that not just by good intentions, but put mechanisms in there. For example, yep. for myself, I figured out a um, long time that if I don't set time aside, I can't learn. Yeah, so I have this, this, uh, this mechanism for myself that one afternoon a week, phone and email goes off, and I use that time to learn. Uh, without that, you know, technology changes so fast as, te as technologists, we need to stay ahead of that or understand it at least. Before we end, can I ask how you learn? Like, what do you do? Do you surf the internet and see what's going on? Or what? how do you make a conscious effort to learn during that period once a week? Well, there's, there's, there's different areas, of course. Sometimes I will just pick up a piece of technology that we've developed internally at, at Amazon or the AWS. 
just because I think it's hard to talk to customers if you don't have that real experience yourself. But, you know, I'm a former academic, so uh, I look at what's happening in, in research and academia. We don't have that many research divisions at large companies anymore, but there's still a few. Yep. So I'm looking at, especially in areas uh, these days where um, what is happening, but it's the future of AI. I mean, it's the technology future there, what's happening? And as such, you know, just spend time reading and just assimilating. So let me ask one other question um, to sum up. When you look at, I don't even know if you want to reflect on your predictions last year. I think we can, I, we can do that separately. But let's, um, when you look ahead to 2024, are you generally optimistic about the landscape, um, Werner, or how are you feeling about the overall opportunities you know, versus I'm risks? Very op I'm very op optimistic. Uh, and not only about because there's this generative AI, I think we still have good old fashioned AI as well that works really, really well. Mm -hmm. yeah, and especially, I'm very much, um, very positive that I've seen more and more young businesses arriving that want to do things for good. Yeah, that, and not because they're, they're a non profit, but because they feel that they can do good and have a good business at the same time. Yeah. And they really are t tackling hard problems. And whether it's the shortage of food or climate change or all these areas, I see more and more uh, uh, companies become extremely excited and using AI technologies, for example, to help solve big problems. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm very, very optimistic. Excellent. I can't think of a better place to end than there. An optimistic outlook from Dr. Werner Vogels. And thank you, as always, for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Diana.